Hello, I'm Tom Cleager and I teach the Foundation Psychology courses here in Canterbury at the University of Kent. One of the fundamental questions asked by psychologists is to what extent human behaviour can be attributed to nature and to what extent it can be attributed to nurture. Is behaviour a result of our genes or our environment? This debate is unresolved, with psychologists adopting different stances. The environmental influences on behaviour are numerous, from parents and the family context to wider society and social media. But can these influences really be more significant than genes? Our DNA is the innate code that is fundamental in determining who we are, our physical attributes, our intellectual capability. How much of our behaviour then is attributable to genes and how much to the environment we grow up in, to social and cultural influences? If behaviour is a product of both nature and nurture, what is the balance of effect and which is more important? And how exactly do these forces combine and interact? Today, I will be focusing on the way nature and nurture both play an integral part in the development of criminal behaviour. What are the causes of crime and can we fully understand them? Let's begin by applying this nature versus nurture debate to personality in general. Take a moment to reflect on your own personality. You may consider yourself outgoing and sociable or shy and preferring your own company. Could personality traits such as these stem from your genetic inheritance or are they a product of your experiences? Theorists such as Isaac have proposed that personality is underpinned by biology. For example, a person with an underactive nervous system is more likely to be an extrovert, whilst a person with an overactive nervous system is more likely to be an introvert. Reflect now on your own family. Are there patterns and consistencies in personality traits across the generations? If so, perhaps this indicates that these traits are inherited. What then are the personality traits that are more likely to lead to criminal behaviour and might these traits be inherited? Well, according to Isaac, 1947, the criminal offender has a particular personality that can be measured. The criminal will score highly for psychoticism, that's aggression and lack of emotion, neuroticism, being overanxious and unstable, and extroversion, that's outgoing and seeking social stimulation. Isaac theorised that the tendency towards extroversion has a biological basis. So it follows that criminality is attributable, at least in part, to nature. But Isaac also stated that socialisation is a key part of the emergency of a criminal tendency. Nature and nurture interact with one another, leading to certain developmental outcomes. This theory suggests a combination of nature and nurture can be important drivers of personality development. With scientific advancement, our ability to identify the role of individual genes in behaviour is now possible. For example, psychologists have identified a role for one version of the MAOA gene in aggression. We know that individuals with this particular version of the gene tend to be more aggressive. Perhaps these individuals are more likely to commit violent crime because they are more prone to acts of aggression. Indeed, the MAOA gene is sometimes called the warrior gene. Bruner, in 1993, studied this phenomenon in a Dutch family who had been involved in violent crime. One discovery relating to the men in the family was that they had the specific version of the warrior gene that codes for aggression. Other psychologists have focused on brain differences in criminals. Christian Kieser's in 2011, suggested the capacity for empathy 
is linked to biology. Criminals may have a neural difference that reduces their capacity for empathy, so they don't have the normal emotional range that might inhibit some acts of crime. Is it possible that a person who commits a violent crime is simply responding to a predisposition for aggression? In 2007, a defence team argued just that in the trial of a man who had committed a violent murder. The team suggested the offender's actions were a result of his genes and asked for this to be taken into account. The judge, on hearing that he possessed a gene coding for aggression, reduced the man's sentence. Let's look now at the impact of nurture on criminal behaviour. Sutherland, in 1939, proposed differential association theory. According to this theory, we learn through interaction with others. And so the social environment has a huge impact on behaviour. For example, surrounded by others whose values and beliefs favour criminal behaviour, we are likely to adopt these same values and beliefs. This theory shifts the debate towards external factors as determinants of criminality. And it has support. Farrington in 2006 found that family environment, factors such as poverty and poor parenting, are determinants of an increased risk for some individuals to turn to crime. Several other psychologists have been strong proponents of nurture as the essence of criminal development. John Bowlby, for example, was convinced that a strong maternal bond in young children is integral to healthy development, and the consequences of disruption to the bond with a primary caregiver are severe. In 1944, Bowlby suggested that the child who is deprived of a strong loving relationship with a mother or mother type figure is more likely to become involved in crime. The child who experiences the loss of an attachment figure is likely to be antisocial, perhaps lacking in empathy. It is therefore nurture that is central to the development of criminal behaviour. Sigmund Freud's theory also emphasises the importance of early childhood and the critical role of mother and father. Freud, in the late 19th century, argued that one part of the personality, the superego, may develop abnormally in the absence of the same-sex parent. According to this theory, if an inadequate superego is formed in early childhood, then one possible consequence is that the child will grow into an adult who is likely to commit, commit crime. Some research considers the effects of both nature and nurture on aggression. Caspi et al. 2002 looked at instances of child maltreatment between the ages of 3 and 11 years. Maltreatment did correlate with aggression. In addition, the researchers found this was a particularly strong effect on those with that specific version of the MAOA gene. This study sheds light on the complex relationship between genes and environment. When it comes to the sentencing of criminals, the impact of nurture on the individual is surely relevant. An individual who experiences early childhood disadvantages in terms of poor parenting and poverty deserves con some consideration of these factors if they find themselves before a judge in a court of law. In terms of how we treat criminals, there has been a shift of emphasis from punishment to rehabilitation. Perhaps this is appropriate given how much we know about the impact of negative early childhood experience on adult behaviour. There is strong evidence to support the theoretical ideas I have discussed today, but the evidence is not conclusive. In other words, the debate over the extent to which criminal behaviour can be attributed to nature or nurture is not resolved. Ultimately, I would say that people make decisions about how they behave. A person who experiences an aggressive tendency can seek help to control their temper. And some individuals are exposed to a hostile environment in their youth, but do not commit crime. The theories proposed by psychologists help us to clarify the level of responsibility and culpability of a criminal. And this is important, 
since it helps us construct a legal framework for dealing fairly with criminals. And the research I have described here can be applied to crime prevention. Armed with the insights of psychologists, we have an opportunity for action to protect vulnerable children from damaging environments that negatively impact on their behaviour. The world we live in has been shaped by the work of psychologists. I've outlined one example today, but there are many others. What next, I wonder? What new findings will psychologists uncover about human behaviour? And how will these findings shape the world in years to come? Perhaps you will be the next influential psychologist, making discoveries that transform the world around you.